All right, so in this video, we're going to start talking about uh, global or absolute mins and maxes. So um, in the last few videos, we've been talking a lot about uh, local mins, local maxes, or you know, relative, local relative, same thing. Um, and we've been talking about using the first derivative test to find those. So um, now when you do global or absolute mins and maxes, usually you're going to look on a closed and bounded interval, maybe something like from uh, 3 to 17 just for example. And actually, it, when you look for global mins on a closed bounded interval like this, uh, it's actually a little bit easier. Um, there's a shorter process that you have to follow uh, in order to do that. So doing that's a little bit easier than it is to find uh, local mins and maxes. But uh, in this example, we're not going to look on a closed uh, bounded interval like that. Um, we're just going to look on the entire domain. And actually, in that case, it uh, makes it just a bit more complicated. Um, just, just a tiny bit more. There's just a little something extra we have to do. Um, and actually, for this particular example, it won't be that bad. But um, so for a closed bounded interval, it's a little bit easier, and we'll see that in the next few videos. But for this one here, we're just going to look on the entire domain. So actually, what that means is we have to follow the same process that we use for local mins and local maxes, uh, just with a tiny something extra at the end, and not really even that much for this example. So um, all right, let's get to it then. So find the absolute extrema. Remember that means mins and maxes. Uh, of y equals x times the natural log of x. So step zero, uh, find the domain of the function. So what's the domain here? Well, uh, natural log of x, so any, anything you take a log of, no matter what the base is, anything you take a log of has to be positive. So x has to be strictly positive, can't be zero, or negative, has to be positive. And uh, we don't get any restrictions from here, okay, so that's okay. So let's go ahead and make a note of this. Um, x has to be greater than zero or uh, an interval notation that's zero to positive infinity. Okay. So that was step zero, find the domain of the function. <clears throat> uh, step one, find all the critical points of the function. So remember to find critical points, we have to find the derivative and then see where's the derivative zero and where's the derivative undefined. So uh, what we have here is x times the natural log of x. So for the derivative, uh, we have to do a product rule here. So y equals x times natural log of x. So uh, if we use the product rule for the derivative, then y prime equals derivative of the first, which is 1, times the second, natural log of x, plus uh, the first, which is x, times the derivative of the second, 1 over x. Okay, so we just did the product rule where x is our first function, natural log of x is the second function, so derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify that. So uh, 1 times natural log of x is just natural log of x. Uh, x times 1 over x is just 1. Okay, so here is our derivative, y primed uh, equals natural log of x plus 1. So that's not too bad, right? It's a uh, fairly simple der uh, derivative, pretty easy to work with. Um, not too bad here. So uh, if we want to find the critical points, remember we have to set this equal to 0, solve for x, and also figure out where is this undefined. Well, first, um, since let's talk about where it's undefined, since there's not much we can do with that. So uh, derivative is natural log of x plus 1. Okay, so this is undefined whenever the natural log of x is undefined, and that happens when x is negative or 0. But um, those don't count for critical points, because remember, to be a critical point, you also have to be in the domain of the original function. But our domain is uh, all the strictly positive numbers. Okay, x has to be strictly greater than 0. And none of these values make this undefined. Okay, so in other words, there are no critical points that, uh, you know, where this place is, or where the derivative is undefined. Okay, so um, all the values of x that make the derivative undefined, they're also not in the domain of the original function. So no critical points from there. But uh, what we can do is take this, set it equal to zero. So natural log of x plus one equals zero, and then solve for x. So that means natural log of x equals negative one. All right, and then here, this, so this is really just a pre-calculus thing now. So remember, if natural log of x equals negative 1, then that's the exact same thing as saying x equals e to the negative 1. Okay, so remember, natural log, that's uh, base e. Okay? And if natural log of x equals negative 1, then basically from the pre-calculus definition of natural log, this means x equals e to the negative 1. Uh, and e to the negative 1 is the same thing as 1 over e, which if you toss into a calculator, you'll see is kind of sort of about uh, 0 0.368. Okay, somewhere around there. So uh, this is our only critical point, okay, e to the negative 1 or 1 over e or approximately uh, 0.368. 
Okay, so um, that's step one, find all the critical points of the function. We only have the one of them, okay, this one right here. And now uh, step two, make a sign chart for the derivative. So let's go set up our sign chart then. All right, so here's our sign chart. Remember, always label your sign chart. So here, this is a sign chart for the derivative, so we'll label it y prime. So uh, notice, though, you know, our domain of the original function is x uh, has to be greater than 0. So we don't have to look on the entire real line. We can just cut it off at 0. So we'll put 0 over here, cut it off here. We don't really even have to erase it, I guess. Um, but why not? OK, so we only have to look here. Now let's put our critical point on here. So remember, it's 1 over e, or e to the negative 1 which is about 0.368, so kind of close to zero, but we'll just put it over here um, just to give ourselves some room here. So this is e to the negative one. Okay, so that's our critical point right there, uh, e to the negative one. Okay, so uh, that's it for step two, usually the easiest step, make a sign chart. And now step three, uh, determine the sign of the derivative in each interval. So we've got two intervals here. One uh, is between zero and e to the negative one, and the other one is uh, everything greater than e to the negative one. So we want to pick one number from each interval and evaluate the derivative at each of those numbers. So um, let's do this uh, interval over here first because it'll be a little bit easier. So remember e to the negative 1, that's about 0.368. So let's pick the number 1. Okay, 1 is going to be in this interval. So let's see what's y primed of 1. y primed of 1, remember here's y primed, so it's going to be natural log of 1 and then plus 1. So this is natural log of 1 and then plus 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 is positive. Okay, so the derivative is positive in this entire interval here. Okay, positive. So that's good. Um, okay, now we have to pick another number in here. So here, um, it's kind of tricky unless, you know, if you're allowed to use a calculator, then what you could do is maybe choose 0 0.3 uh, or 0 0.2, 0 0.1. 0.237, anything goofy like that. Just anything positive that's less than this number here, that's less than 1 over e. Um, you know, you can use that. So remember, this is just an approximation, though. Um, so, you know, you kind of be careful if you're going to pick another approximation or just pick another decimal and put it into your calculator. Be careful with that. Uh, 0.3 or 0.2, those are safe numbers to pick. Um, you can toss those into your calculator, uh, into this expression using a calculator, and then see what that approximately equals. But um, you know, if you'd rather do it analytically, or if you're not allowed to use a calculator, um, then what you could do is pick uh, e to the negative 2. So e to the negative 2, so let's see that real quick. Uh, e to the negative 2, that's 1 over e squared, right? And since e squared is larger than e, then this is less than 1 over e, okay? 1 over e squared is less than 1 over e because e squared is larger. You're dividing by a larger number here, right? And remember, 1 over e, that's this guy right here, e to the negative 1. So e to the negative 2 is strictly less than e to the negative 1, and it's still positive. This is still a positive number. Okay, e to any uh, number here is going to be positive. e to any real number is positive. So um, okay, e to the negative 2 is somewhere inside this interval here. So let's go ahead and see what's y primed of e to the negative 2. Okay, well, that's going to be natural log of e to the negative 2. All right, and then plus 1. Okay, so natural log of e to the negative 2. So remember, uh, natural log of e to a thing is just that thing. Okay? Um, because the natural log function and the exponential function with base e, those are uh, inverse functions, so they're going to kind of undo each other, I guess. Uh, so natural log of e to a thing is just that thing. And then plus 1 still. All right, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, which is negative. Okay? So um, y prime of e to the negative 2, that's a negative number. All right. So that means the derivative is negative in this entire interval here. All right. So um, that's step three. Determine the sign of the derivative in each interval. Okay. So um, now step four is going to be apply the first derivative test to find the extrema. So then after that, there's a little something extra we have to do, which, uh, you know, as we already mentioned, is not really a whole lot for this particular example. But um, let's go ahead and write down what we just found out. So. Uh, y primed, let's section out this piece, y primed is negative uh, on this interval here from 0 to e to the negative 1. And uh, y primed is positive 
on this interval here from uh, e to the negative 1 all the way up to infinity. So on uh, e to the negative 1 to positive infinity. Okay, so remember, uh, if the derivative is negative, that means that the function is decreasing. If the derivative is positive, that means that the function is increasing. Okay? So you know, we don't really even have to write all this out, but it's not a bad idea. But if we want to apply the first derivative test, you know, that's step four here, apply the first derivative test to find the extrema, um, then we can just say, okay, first derivative test says uh, here, if y prime is negative, and then y prime is positive. So the derivative changes from negative to positive right at this value of x here. So this means when x equals e to the negative 1, we have a local min. Okay, we have a local min. All right, so uh, now this function has a local min at x equals e to the negative 1. But remember, we're not looking for local or relative. We're looking for a global or absolute here, right? So um, there's a theorem, though, that tells us uh, if we have only one critical point, okay, if we have only one critical point and uh, it's a local min, then it's also a global min, okay? And that's exactly what's happening here. We have one critical point and it's a local min. So that theorem tells us it's automatically a global min, okay? Uh, and also, if you were to graph this function, if you toss this function into a graphing calculator, you'll see uh, this is definitely a global min right here. Um, likewise, uh, you know, the theorem also says if you have only one critical point and it's a local max, then uh, it's also a global max, but that doesn't really apply here. Okay, so we only have the local min here. So there aren't any local maxes, there aren't any global maxes because the function just keeps shooting off, you know, uh, here if y prime is positive, which means the function keeps increasing as we move further away to the right uh, from e to the negative one. So the function keeps increasing as we go further to the right past this point. Uh, so there aren't any maxes, okay? The function just keeps increasing without bound. Um, okay, so this right here, is our global min. This is where the global min happens. So, uh, so remember, it's only one critical point and it's a local min. That means that it's also a global min. All right. So let's go ahead and write down what we have then. Uh, so there's a global min, global min at uh, x equals e to the negative one. Okay. So that's really, you know, that's the extent of the question, pretty much. Find the absolute extrema of y equals x, l, and x. Um, well, actually, you know, we also have to find out what is the absolute extrema. So uh, when it says find the absolute extrema, that kind of means, uh, you know, find the actual value. Okay, so it's a little ambiguous. So in that case, it's best to just be safe um, and find the actual value and where it occurs. So we just found where it occurs, so let's figure out what is it. Well, how do we find out what it is? Um, remember, we just take this value of x and we plug it back into the original function because we're talking about mins, maxes, and stuff like that of the original function here. Okay, so we know that this function y, we just found out that it has a global min at this value of x, okay? This function has a global min when x equals e to the negative one. So if we want to find what the global min actually is, we take this value of x and we stick it into this function here. So um, when x equals, let's write it down over here, uh, when x, equals e to the negative one, uh, what happens with y? y equals e to the negative one times the natural log of e to the negative one. Okay, y equals uh, e to the negative one times the natural log of e to the negative one. Okay? So e to the negative one, that's just one over e. <clears throat> Sorry, kind of running out of room here. Uh, e to the negative one is one over e. Natural log of e to a negative uh, e to the negative one. Remember, natural log of e to a thing is just that thing. Okay, so this is just negative one. So this is one over e times negative one, which is uh, negative one over e. Okay. So this is the value of the global min. Okay, the global min happens at x equals e to the negative one, uh, and it is it is y equals uh, negative one over e. Or we could let's go ahead and write this as negative e to the negative one. Uh, why not? Just a safe space here. So this is, you know, uh, so I guess we just could have left that as e to the negative 1. So um, negative 1 times e to the negative 1. So that's what our uh, min actually is, okay? This is the value that it is, and this is where it happens, okay? It happens at x equals e to the negative 1, and it is y equals negative e to the negative 1, okay? So uh, that's what the global min. And this function has uh, no global max. Remember, there's no global max. All right, and again, uh, the little tiny extra step we had to do was, you know, we apply the first derivative test here. 
Um, and then we use that theorem, which we didn't really write down, but we use that theorem that says uh, if you have only one critical point and you have a local min there, then it's also a global min. Okay? So, you know, if you kind of think about that, um, if you have only one critical point, then you have only one place where the derivative is zero or undefined. So only one potential place to have a min or a max. Okay? So if you only have one of those, um, and it actually is a min, then it has to be global min also, because you can never turn back around again and go below that, right? So, um, so before we move on to that, this is pretty much it for this question. Uh, find the absolute extreme of y equals x ln x. This is it. Uh, global min at x equals e to the negative one is y equals negative e to the negative one. Okay, so that's it for the question. Let's talk a little bit about that theorem we used here. So um, now what we said was if you have a uh, uh, just one critical point. If you have only one critical point and it's a local min, then you also have a global min there. So let's see why that is. So this isn't really a proof, but just kind of uh, an intuitive idea behind it. So let's say we have uh, a function here. So let's say our function has uh, only one critical point. So here's our function here. It has only one critical point, um, and it's a local min, right? So if this is the only critical point, this function, you know, this has to be global min, okay? Because the function can never turn back around and go below that. Because if the function turns back around and goes below, then you have another critical point. But that violates the, uh, you know, restriction that you have only one critical point, okay? So if you got only one critical point, uh, the function can never turn back around, okay? Just because it, since it has only this one critical point here, you know, the function just has to keep going off this way, uh, keep going off this way, right? Um, and I mean, that's pretty much it. So if you have more than one critical point, then, you know, you might, I mean, you might have something like this if you have another critical point, uh, but you just don't know, okay? You, you know, it might do something like that. Uh, but the point is, if you have only one critical point, then you're guaranteed that as long as that's a local min, then it also has to be a global min because the function can never come back around and give you something less than that, okay? Because if the function comes back around again, then you have more than one critical point but we already know we only have the one critical point. Okay, so that's kind of what happened here with this function, um, was we found only one critical point. So there was only one place where the function could turn back around pretty much. Um, so that's the intuitive idea behind it. Uh, anyway, all right, so that's it for this video. And then in the next few videos, um, we'll talk about doing the same thing, but on a closed and bounded interval, which actually makes it a little bit easier. So there's a shorter process for those.